So welcome everyone to Adoption Engagement Forum on the 9th of December 2022. It's great to see some new faces um, here this morning. So um, thank you everyone for joining. Um, I'll just quickly um, highlight for the, anyone new or anyone who um, isn't aware that we have an open active Slack workspace and that's a great place to keep in touch with everything that's going on with open active and um, keep uh, up to date with the adoption engagement forum and uh, um, upcoming agendas meetings uh, and links to past recordings and things like that so um, if you haven't already then please do sign up at uh, slack.openactive.io um, and yeah, that would be great and it'd be great to great to have you there and just quickly look at the agenda for this morning so we um, have a uh, Good agenda this morning, I think, hopefully it'll lead to some really interesting discussions. So we've got um, a look at This Girl Can and This Girl Can Classes Activity Finder. Um, so we were scheduled to have Claire from Sport England, but um, we're just uh, chatting and Alex from EMD UK is uh, going to, to lead that discussion for us. So that should be really good, thank you. And then we're, it's great to have Jess here from Activity Alliance, who I think will follow on from uh, similar threads from, from some of that. Um, the scale can classes as well talking about activity finders and, and the inclusivity of those and um, so that should be really interesting and then we've also got barry here who is going to provide an update on the parasport campaign and the parasport activity finder as well so yeah it should be some really interesting discussions and, and, and looking forward to that this morning and um, just quickly there's quite a few new people here so it'd be great to just do a quick round of introductions if that's okay so i'll start with myself i'm tim corby and i'm an engagement consultant uh, working at the open data institute and um, so i work on on open active for the odi um, so if we can quickly just go around and get get everyone to just uh, introduce themselves with nothing crazy just a, a quick name and organization that'd be great um, so in no particular order other than where you are on my screen, if I could start with you, Alex. Hi, uh, I'm Alex. I'm the Head of Marketing and Communications at EMD UK. Uh, we're a system partner of Sport England and we represent group exercise instructors, both kind of community and operators, uh, sorry, operator instructors, uh, and kind of represent and advocate for group exercise instructors. Great. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Chris? Morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris. I'm the data management specialist here at the ODI, working on the Open Active Initiative. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Jules. Uh, hi. Yes, I'm Jules from York Sport Foundation. We're an active partnership up in the uh, part of Yorkshire that doesn't have a coastline. <laughs> Fantastic. Thanks, Jules. Uh, Ollie. Sorry. Hi. I'm Ollie from London Sport. Thanks, Ollie. Uh, Jess, if I could come to you next. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Cook from Activity Alliance. I am one of the strategic partnership advisors. Um, for, for those of you that don't know, Activity Alliance is a system partner of Sport England. We're funded to support organisations to be more inclusive and accessible and bridge the gap and the fairness issue between disabled people and non-disabled people being active. Great. Thanks, Jess. Uh, Geraldine, if I could come to you next. Hi, good morning. So yeah, I'm Geraldine. I work with Jules at Yorkshire Sport Foundation and I'm the Data and Insight Manager. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, if I could come to you next. Uh, hi, I'm Andrew Newman from the ODI. Um, I've been with the ODI for five days now um, and I'm going to be the project lead for Open Active. Um, so I'm really interested in the agenda today and finding out a bit more about the sports sector and how Open Active helps it. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, Antoinette? Hopefully I said your name right. Yeah, you did. That was perfect. Hi, uh, I'm Antoinette. I work for EMD UK, um, predominantly on this girl camp classes, but I did also work on Class Finder. Um, so yeah, lovely to see you all. Thank you. Uh, Charlie? Good morning, everyone. Director at Playfinder, Charlie Clark, Charlie Merrick Clark, Director at Playfinder Powering Book Tech. We offer a Playfinder sports booking marketplace and also power a sports facility booking platform in Book Tech. Great. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, David? Yeah, I'm David Dinnage. I'm the Head of Communications at the ODI, I'm putting together the communications plan for Open Active for next year and running some of the activities. Thanks, David. Uh, Adam? Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm Adam Freeman Pass from Sport England. Uh, I'm the Head of Digital Innovation. Uh, firstly, just saying it's awesome that so many different people from so many organisations this morning. So thanks so much for, for joining us. 
Um, yeah, my, my work uh, crosses things like Open Active, the Digital Marketing Hub, which was relaunched in November, uh, Digital Maturity Tool with UK Active that was launched, their report launched the other week, uh, and uh, interesting things like digital inclusion as well. Um, so that's me. Thanks, Adam. Uh, Barry? Good morning, all. How are we doing? Uh, Barry Lloyd here from British Paralympic Association, um, the Parasport uh, Manager. And for those that aren't aware, Parasport's uh, <laughs> inclusive online activity finder and, and a bit of a community and programme around it as well. Thanks, Barry. And uh, Nick? Hello, Nick from Iman. Thanks, Nick. And then just sneaking in, I think halfway through, uh, Dominic. I don't know if you're there. If you're able to just uh, give a quick name and name and organisation. Hi, uh, Dominic here, also from Imen. Hi, everyone. Great. Thanks very much, Dominic. Great to see you all here. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, I think we'll just uh, crack on straight with the agenda, if that's okay. So I think I'm handing over to you, Alex, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, can I share my screen? Uh, you should be able to. If you just give me one second, I will stop sharing and I will make you a host or a co-host. Hey, yep, yeah, that's coming through. That's coming through. Okay, so this is not going to be death by PowerPoint or anything horrible. Um, Whereas we've got quite a short time, which is not good for me because I like a, a little waffle. Um, so for those of you, who so we've got quite a few people here and I'm glad Charlie's on the call because he's got quite a long history with us in this, uh, in the Playways world. So um, basically it's like as EMD UK, we're the national governing body for group exercise. Um, my previous colleague, uh, Jade Cation, was quite heavily involved with Open Active and, and the ODI and, and sort of bringing open data to group exercise instructors. Uh, it's something as a organization, we're sort of you know, strategically championing as part of our kind of five year plan. Um, there's been two main kind of methods which we've sort of practically done this, uh, which was through ClassFinder and Biscard Can classes. So ClassFinder was a it was an integrated class search group exercise, which we set up with Playways uh, while Charlie was there. Um, so we did quite a lot of work along that. And throughout lockdown, obviously, it was huge, big move on to digital and all those things. Um, as part of our new sort of strategy, we've stepped back from actively running that and Playways have kind of taken over a lot of the day to day there for us. Additionally, with Playways, we built uh, this girl can classes class search, which was similar. And the idea was to bring together via open data all of the different this girl can classes across the country into a central area where we could direct consumers as part of the kind of marketing campaigns that we were running. Um, that has sort of there we go. So you should see that this girl can classes screenshot. See, it's very similar to, to Class Finder, and you can see the kind of integration there with Playways. Um, basically, as part of the kind of agreement with Spoon and how we we're going to run this girl can, we agreed that then well, we agreed that there needed to be a sort of central uh, system for us to direct people to that we are marketing because we're running kind of na nationwide national campaigns for consumers. We need somewhere to bring all of those together. Um, in terms of getting that rolled out, we went through a couple kind of steps. So we obviously started with some more general kind of uh, benefits about open data, booking systems, et cetera, you know, the kind of move to, to tech, um, which we've run through kind of sort of pages. So we've got some systems and some web pages that they can go to. We've got some internal support documents for our instructors and as part of their welcome webinars and things, we, we work through that. Uh, Uptake has been low um, and we went as far as doing a deal with players where we could basically offer kind of the open data booking systems to some of our initial cohorts um, at the point of becoming an instructor. Um, and again, we kind of had sort of various levels of interest, but we couldn't move that forward into kind of taking action. Uh, so we then kind of stepped up and as a team, we basically worked again. Charlie did a lot for us on this, as you can see this theme. But again, we worked with Charlie to come up with some strategies where we could sort of manually intervene and do some of this work for people, particularly through open sessions, uh, with the idea that we could sort of demonstrate that and the kind of the proofs in the pudding, put it out there, get their classes on and, and remove some of the kind of feedback we'd have. 
Um, I mean, it was fairly successful. It's allowed us to get a big bulk of classes on there, but we have had, again, sort of declining levels of people refreshing and, and working within this. When we've gone out to our audience, and sorry for the big chunk of data, this is much more just a kind of notes thing for me to, to talk through, but we've had kind of two main audiences. We've got our instructors, which generally are self-employed sort of micro businesses. They work in the community um, or they're kind of self-employed, but work by our operators and other venues. And then we've got our more kind of operators who will have their own instructors who are teaching this kind of classes as part of their offering. Um, the main things we've kind of had back around is, and some of them we've had real success with. So I know like everyone active is open data enabled. It's been great. They took a load of classes. It's worked really well. Some of our other ones have been more uh, of a struggle to get on. And it's around that kind of change and asking them, they feel like they're taking something new. Uh, and some of them where they're using a couple of the major kind of internal systems, there is, although they're kind of open data ready, there is a still kind of cost for them to get that going. Um, we've had some interesting feedback as well, as some have just said, like, look, we don't want our classes to appear next to our competitors. <laughs> we want to generate our own traffic. We want to bring consumers into our website. And we want them on our system in a captive kind of uh, audience. And then with our instructors, you know, we have a mixture now. We have a real broad range of, of instructors. So we have some that are super digital native and kind of see the value. Um, predominantly, they've come through kind of either Bookwen as a booking system or Jim Catch. So Bookwen is data, open data enabled and Jim Catch isn't. Um, we have the kind of usual struggles there where people are like, oh, I'm very bored into this system. It's got all of my stuff on it. It's going to take a lot of effort to move. Um, social media being a huge driver for consumers to find classes still means that a lot of our people are like well I, I get bookings on Facebook and I can take payment on PayPal they can come and bring me cash and that works um and then again this kind of admin side particularly at the minute but see people are shortening class timetables venues etc so people are getting a bit worried about that and it's kind of again the admin time poor end becomes a much bigger uh sort of problem for them so, sorry, I feel like I've spoken super quickly because I'm a bit worried about the time, but that's the kind of background of where we are now. The practical kind of issue for us here is we're struggling to get the kind of instructors and operators in the, in the kind of sector to reach critical mass where it becomes like, well, everyone's on here, I need to be on here. Um, so we are struggling, we've run kind of education pieces as we go on. The practical kind of problem for this with us now is we're running, particularly going into January, a lot of consumer facing campaigns, particularly group exercise, a big spike in participation around this time. And it's made our booking journey pretty uh, slightly uh, difficult for consumers because we are marketing across as a nationwide, sending them to this. Some of our classes aren't listed. We're struggling to get people listed. And then where they are, we kind of off fill them here into a you know everyone active, active booking system and it's quite a bitty journey so i think what we've kind of come here with is some i guess asks around either support ideas you've got um you know we're struggling with adoption and engagement so this seemed like a great forum to come and bring some challenges to um and then to look at either you know if you guys have ideas or things that have worked in the past that we can kind of action fairly quickly or looking at collaboration uh, to kind of help that and then we take away and look at kind of practical ideas to, to sort of smooth out our booking journey as it stands. Great, thank you, Alex. Um, that's really good. I guess um, I'll probably just open the floor straight up to uh, see if there are any any questions or, or comments or, or anything to um, to run by Alex. In, uh, in the absence of, um, uh, well, in the presence of silence, I'm happy to, to speak. Obviously, I wasn't quite close to this work, but I've got the benefit of um, looking at it from two angles now as an outsider, but also probably wearing my Open Active Steering Committee hat. I think one of the things I can really see that a piece of work like this um, is struggling with is the what's the value to those instructors um, opening their data, and that they've got one of two ways to do that. 
um, it's encouraging their current system provider to to um, become compliant, or they've got to move system provider, which is an operational overhead. So that both those have quite severe severe barriers. Uh, changing their system is not a small decision, and the investment by the the system to actually implement isn't isn't small either. I think they wouldn't necessarily do it for a sing a single or a small cohort of instructors. Um, I think we're still in a place, um, and it'd be interesting for those other data publishers on the call for, for you to speak about where there might be some either collaboration or crossover here. I think we're still in a place identified by ODSC as part of their sustainability review um, in, in 2021, I think, um, or certainly finished early 2021, that um, there's a, we've got a sort of a smallish bottleneck of, of data publishers, meaning there's a lack of lack of value of where the data is actually going to, to providers to go. This is worth me opening because I know my data is going to be here, here, and here, and it's going to bring me an increased audience. Um, it's not to take away from the the size, scale, and impact that a campaign like this girl can and this girl can classes obviously, obviously has the ability to have, but it is still only one one place. And it, what I'd suggest is we're still seeing the evidence that providers just aren't seeing that value yet. Um, and I don't know whether that as a narrative just helps sort of inspire any other conversation or input from others on, you know, where else we, the instructors, we, we can see whether we can see opportunities for, for extending the reach of those instructors to, as to where their data goes and, and bringing more participants their way. Yeah, I think that's quite useful as well. And I think it could be that it's going to places that we're just not properly kind of letting instructors know about at the minute. Um, we are putting some bits together. We got some insight from a participant survey about a slight decline in finding classes via social media. Um, so I think that gives us a little bit of an angle to kind of say, you know, it's not ubiquitous now. Like people are looking elsewhere, people are searching, people are doing this. But right now we kind of go with, a, you know, I guess the, the explanation of this will pull through into a variety of different places. And it's like a nice search engine for a different... But it's hard to really pin that down and say, you're going to go here, you're going to go here. We yeah. know that people are looking here for classes. We know people are looking here for exercise styles, whatever it may be. So it's hard for us to really kind of pin that kind of explicit value onto it. Yeah. Um, and as you say, I think the kind of operational change is big at the minute. And obviously it's a big deal for kind of, you know, our operators where it becomes uh, more of a kind of capital project. For our community instructors, it's more about that time for an admin and then just reducing costs as much as possible. So people are like, well, I get bookings through Facebook and I can barely afford to run my venue heating. So we've got to stack these things up. So it was kind of a challenge in terms of getting people to buy in. And it's, you know, that kind of sector change is always going to take time. Uh, so Alex, I think from us, it, sorry. So I was going to say, when you're talking about um, this girl can classes publishing and the benefit of being on the on the search, do you also talk about the likes of Classfinder as a as an extra value add there? Um, and I guess I remember a lot of activation and training of instructors was actually happening up in Manchester or certainly the, the early start of that. So MCR Active would come into play as well as a as a as a leading marketplace by the, by the team there. It's not to say the other active partnership activity finders, which there's 23, wouldn't, but they've obviously got to be relevant by location and um uh that gets a little bit more picky as to the, the audience communication you don't want to tell someone down in in the southwest about about the Yorkshire sport activity finder as an example it just wouldn't be relevant it would miss the point yeah i think there is definitely something there sorry adam sorry alex i didn't want to cut you off there actually i've just um <laughs> just popping popping a thought in you know when you're talking about actually you know that they're, they're for them for for for, uh, for an instructor for them they they have a belief that sort of social media is the way to reach their audience and kind of drive booking into classes um i guess it's an interesting one isn't it Cause when you said about capital expense in terms of changing system or to invest in making the data open or you know do that up, that bit of upfront cost there i guess it's it's getting an understanding of how much they're spending on social media to promote those classes which might be more drip fed right and getting an idea of how much they spend in total over a year just so we get a bit of a balance of the costs do you know what I mean I don't know if that's something that um that in in forums that you have with them if they've started to discuss that openly because it's one of those things isn't it that if with, with any social media channel like you, you actually have to put a fair amount of paid spend generally to get any real traction with this stuff unless they're just relying on like people in their groups that they've then they're, they're then just yeah. kind of driving off the groups right it's predominantly that so we do work and i guess as with a lot of audiences right we've got a group of sort of we've got a group of generally sort of more kind of entrepreneurial micro business type people who are like i see this as 
you know, something to make money from a career, something I can do that's a sustainable kind of career. And they are a little bit more kind of savvy with this kind of thing and digital advertising, et cetera. What we've got for the majority of group exercise instructors is local kind of groups and, and things like that. And it kind of works, do you know, <laughs> for this product, it's, uh, it, I guess it's stepping back a little bit, but it does, it does work really well. So we've all got local community action groups. We've got, you know, I live on a housing estate. We've got about four different ones breaking this down by close. Do you know what I mean? So that's where they will apportion most of their time because it's simple, free, and it's quite targeted. Um, so we end up kind of mixing against that is that it's not an outright cost. And that's sort of generally when we move or we talk about booking systems, we get a very similar kind of pushback in terms of, oh, I can market on a local Facebook group for free. So, you know, we're there. Now, we kind of start talking to people around things like social media. And I think, you know, there has been a decline um, off the top of my head. I think it was about six, seven percent reduction in people who said that's the main way I find classes. But that is still the number one way that people buy glasses, even if it's slightly declining. Specifically with this girl, Cam, we've got a slightly stronger argument. Um, and it's something we're working on with our agency because we run a central marketing campaign for this girl, Cam glasses generally. Now, we don't want to split that up into 112 different uh, campaigns to direct them to individual sites. So we do have that kind of argument. And that's where we've gone in, in a kind of dual approach which is here is open data generally benefits etc and then also by the way if you do that you're going to get access to all of this and here's a bunch of sort of stats about how we're driving traffic and that and i think for us it's yeah it's, it's a change project and i think for us we kind of went into this and sort of thought hopefully we will get that kind of critical mass and adoption point that it becomes a i need to be on this because all of my competitors are and we haven't quite reached that and I think there's probably more that we could do from that kind of content and showing the value. But I also think realistically, we may need to look at ways to kind of solve those issues practically in the short term so that we can create a kind of reasonable booking journey for the for the consumers. Thanks, Alex. This seems like a really rich, um, rich discussion, but uh, I'm just conscious of time. So, yes. so if it's OK, Obviously, you've uh, all got my details. So if anyone does want to reach out to me offline, uh, just drop me an email. Uh, it should be on the invite. If not, I can follow up so that someone can send it around. Uh, and if anyone's got any ideas or, or kind of wants to chat offline about anything around this area, just reach out to me. Yeah, that sounds great. And I wonder whether if um, if you uh, had the details at, at the start of the call, but if um, you were able to sign up to the to the Slack workspace and, and yes. worth, um, posting a message in there, and uh, yeah. that, that, that could generate, sense, doesn't it? Yeah. generate some discussion. <laughs> So that, that could be really useful. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Alex. And um, so I don't mind if you if you don't mind, just um stop stop sharing your your screen. Yeah. Um and then I think uh next up on the agenda we've got you, Jess, if that's okay. I don't know if you've got any slides or anything you want to share if, if... yeah, I've got a couple of slides. Okay, great. Um I think hopefully you should be able to share. Uh, so Jess is from the Activity Alliance, and she's just going to talk around um, some sort of inclusivity on Activity Finder. So over to you, Jess. <clears throat> Brilliant. Um, one second. Let me. Oh, I don't want to do that, do I? <laughs> you think I'd be used to this by now? <laughs> um, <clears throat> let's move that out of the way. Um, okay, brilliant. I literally just have a couple of slides, so um, please don't worry, and I won't probably be anywhere near the 15 minutes, but um, I just wanted to talk to you all about some issues that we've had highlighted to us around the um, activity finders and the platforms that are being used. I don't expect there to be any solutions made today, but it was just more about letting you know of kind of what had come up and, and if there was a way of looking at this in the future. Um, so hopefully you can see the slide on the screen. Um, so um, looking at the platform, and this is just a very limited selection of what we've been told about. We're getting um, information through from counties and individuals telling us that uh, the accessibility within the activity finders isn't consistent, um, which is causing individuals problems and issues being able to use them, navigate around them and uh, just being able to be part of what's happening within the activity finders and their overall uh, objective. 
We know that there's issues around imagery, that there isn't um, uh, a comparable imagery of disabled people being active as well. So not all the time disabled people are looking at these platforms and kind of going, well, actually, this might not be for me because there's nobody like me that's on that. And we know that that comes up quite a lot. Uh, we have heard that there's a uh, screen reader incapacity. In, not compatible um sorry put my words back in my mouth um so they aren't accessible so screen readers aren't able to read them the imagery that is on there hasn't been set up to have all text on it so a screen reader can't navigate itself around um and it's just making sure that the capacity and the capability of the the platforms that we've got and the information that's being uploaded onto there is being done in an in an inclusive and accessible fashion. Um, we're being told that a lot of the searches are just by disability sport um, opportunities, not by inclusive sport opportunities. So if somebody does a search and looking for activities for disabled people, it's only giving them the options of disability sport specific activity and not necessarily highlighting where activity has been selected as being inclusive. Now, I don't know whether this is a function of the platforms that are being used or whether it's the way that the information is being put onto the platforms. But again, it's just something that we're being told about. Um, searches aren't always allowing for access requirements to be highlighted. So if individuals need to know whether something is wheelchair accessible or if they have signing capacity through BSL um, or whether it's for... Um, a seated activity, things like that, unless it's specifically said, those requirements aren't necessarily um, highlighted within the search area. Um, and intersectionality is causing a bit of a problem. So you can search by woman or, or women, you can search by um, ethnic diversity or disability. But if you're looking for activity that crosses all of those elements, that is causing a problem within um, being able to, maybe you're a Muslim woman that has a disability and you want a female only session, you can't necessarily search via that. Um, so that's causing problems around that as well. Again, these are just very, very top highlighted um, bits that I've picked out for us to, today, but there are probably many more that are coming through and that we are being told about. Um, the other side of it is the journey that individuals are taking when they're getting there. So, um, and I know this isn't necessarily about the activity finder, but it's something that we need to be aware of when individuals are clicking through, that once they are clicking through from the activity finder onto the sites of the individual sessions that are available, they're not getting through to the right pages and the right information within those pages themselves. Um, there's also the, the problem, the age old problem, which we aren't going to be able to um, solve around the accessibility of those external sites. So everything I've just discussed on the first page is coming through on the second page, but the individual users are struggling with that because of the inconsistency. Um, we are getting information around um, club sessions without websites. Um, are struggling to be able to be used to use the um activity finders a lot of multi-sport disability um, clubs and sessions don't have websites or the option of online payment so they aren't necessarily able to put all the information on and for them to be fully part of the activity finders um, there's a need for multiple contact points as well so not just having one or two areas of contact there needs to be multiple contact points for individuals to be able to choose which way they wish to um, contact or have further information around the activity that's being provided and um, multiple payment options as well is coming up as a problem a lot of disabled people don't have online access to banking um, so if that's the only way that a lot of these um, sessions are being asked for payment through either paypal or online banking that's massively causing individual disabled people some problems because they don't have access to their own online banking systems as I said, um, really top line, high level areas that I wanted to kind of bring across with you today. Um, I don't expect us to, to even have a conversation about it. It's not necessarily something that if you feel that it's not something you can solve or ask questions about now, then that's fine. Um, but I just wanted to let you know of the areas that we are kind of being told regularly around um, issues and problems. And it would be really nice to be able to have consistency across them. 
The other area that um, has come through as well is that there's inconsistency between active partnership um, um, activity finders that and a lot of disabled people do cross counties to do activity. So um, they're finding information in one county, but they're not able then to get the same information in another. So it's just making sure that we are kind of looking at how this looks to, to have the consistency across all of the areas that we're working with. And I know that's not gonna be easy when we're all using different platforms, but it would be nice if there is kind of a set of guidelines or something along those lines that help um, individuals kind of access where they're going. Um, as I said, I don't expect anybody to kind of come up with the questions and answers today, but these are my contact details. Um, happy to kind of have a conversation further around it. And there are obviously organisations out there that do specifically support with the um, online accessibility side of it. Um, but I will stop sharing my screen now. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Jess. I think that's really, really important. Um things to raise and pick up on and and for people to go and and be thinking about i think there's a, a couple of just um from my initial thoughts a, a couple of things um that maybe nick and andrew can take away to consider for the w3c group in terms of, of the technical side of, of standards but i think there's also some aspects around the engagement and, and how we increase and improve the um amount of of data and information around accessible opportunities that is out there um so i don't know if does anyone have any questions for jess or thoughts on what she's um on the issue she's raised no, Sorry. Questions. i have questions jess. Oh, really good to see it come to the come to life so so oh yeah go, go for it charlie and then andrew will come to you after charlie uh, I was just saying, yes, just really helpful to see it brought to the table and come to life. It's um, really helpful to get that viewpoint, I think, and one we we need to listen to over time. Brilliant, thank you. Thanks, Charlie. And Andrew, I think you were just about to jump in. Yeah, it was interesting feedback. Thanks, Jess. Um, you mentioned it a couple of times in, in your presentation, um, but I'm wondering if you have a sense of how many of the issues are caused by the the structure of the data and how many of the issues are to do with the way the data is presented in the various activity finders? I think it's a mixture of both that the information is not being uploaded in an accessible fashion, but also the information is not um, showing what that accessibility is as well. So I do think there's a, a true area of both of the issues that are coming through with that. Um, and it, it just comes from lack of knowledge and information of people that are uploading information, but also the way that potentially the way that the finders um, the platforms are being developed isn't then prompting people to be looking at those areas as well so ensuring that they are something that they're looking at as far as accessibility is concerned yeah that, that's really interesting thank you so there's probably something we need to do in terms of thinking about the data and the, the data standard and data model and the guidance around that and there's probably something we need to do in terms of helping people providing activity finders to make them more accessible generally absolutely yeah thank you I might ask silly questions. I'm only a week in. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> I like silly questions. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew. Um, Alex? I'm on a very similar theme, so hopefully it's not a silly question because I've been longer <laughs> than five days. But um, I guess similarly for us, we're not a provider or, a, or the, one of the companies building the, the tech and data unless it's in a nice, simple read uh, with colours is, is not for me. But in terms of how we work with our instructors and getting them to upload or, or where we work with, you know, I'm thinking both Classfinder and This Girl Cam, we have a group of instructors who utilise that. Is there something, if the systems are prompting people to do that in an accessible way, is there something we can kind of deliver in terms of education pieces or something simple, best practice that we can go out and give to people and say, like, this is what you need to be working towards in order for this to kind of meet the accessibility end? I think it's about looking at the fact of what, um, and we, we, we would be happy to kind of look at this with you, um, is something along the lines of thinking about what disabled people would want to know. So um, the the experience of the instructor, whether the venue that they're using is accessible, if it's not accessible, what is the limitations around that venue? Um, it's looking at kind of class sizes, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it's also, a, there's a, a big thing around disabled people kind of not having experience activity at all in the first instance. And if they go to an opportunity for the first time, they may have very, very, very low levels of 
uh, fitness and if they're entering a beginners class but the beginners have been there for two years then their level of activity is going to be higher than what somebody's that's done nothing before and that, that could be a really intimidating position to be in um, there's also an element around instructors giving opportunities at the beginning of sessions to enable individuals to give private information around what support they do and do not need and having that information to be able to either put somewhere in a um, a private fashion either when they're booking on or whether they the instructor is openly saying please come and see me 10 minutes before the session when they're going to book on is giving people that confidence that they can kind of get the support and understanding that they need to be able to do the session right Thanks, um, Jess. Uh, Chris, I'll come to you. I think you were next, and then Jules, and then I think after after Jules, we might have to move on to um, to the next agenda item. Over to you, Chris. Thank you. Uh, just a brief comment. Um, hi, Jess. Uh, no, thanks for that. It's um, yeah, a few of the things that you mentioned are possibly a lot of things that I'm kind of working on at the moment in my capacity here at the ODI. So, a lot of the things I'm looking at is the current sort of guides and resources that are available on the Open Active website, and one thing that I've recently written that will be shared out is a, an improving data quality guide um, for the community so it's just what the things that you were kind of saying there I think tie into what it's not it's not um, a, a technical heavy one it's just a very simple look this is the kind of things you need to input this is what you need to see um, to help you know people get more active on there so I'm gonna book a, a time in with yourself I've got I've written down your email from that slide so I'm gonna book a call in with yourself have a quick one-to-one and just go into that a bit more detail and I think we can work together just to make sure we get the right um, information on that guide. Okay, brilliant. Thanks. Uh, Jules, come to you. Tar, yeah, I was, I put in the comments about keywords and hashtag searches. That seems to be one solution for a really complex set of searches, narrowing them down. So if there's a kind of hashtag beginner, then people who were really wanting those very first steps could actually put that in a search and then at least that would filter out the ones that are more designed to do other things that that seems to be the way of trying to answer what could be a thousand different questions and i think this is the thing that a lot of stuff if you can get it right for disabled people and put their support in the need in for disabled people it actually helps everybody because um there will be elements that disabled people need that actually a lot of other people do as well regardless of whether they have a disability or not Thanks. We're unfortunately we're running quite tight on time, but Nick, I see you've got your hand up. So if you want to just quick, quickly um, make make the yeah. point. Sure. Thanks, Tim. Uh, no point. Just a quick couple of questions um, for this for record uh, sake. Uh, Jess, uh, were you involved in the W3C activity around um, the the accessibility stuff that happened last year? Um, no, I think one of my colleagues might have been, but we had very, very limited um, connection to it. That's really helpful to know because some of the things you're saying are kind of new and weren't included in that work. So great to great to spot that. And second question for clarification is um, you mentioned there's activity finders in that research that you've presented today. Um, do you have is it are you able to give a quick list of those? Is, is that somewhere that we can get to or just as a sense of where what activity finders were included in that? It was so, just um, I wouldn't say it's research. <laughs> it was more of what people have kind of suggested to us, um, and we'd have had feedback from across the across the counties. So um, myself and my colleagues work across um, all um, England regions, um, and a lot of the um, information that we're getting fed back to us from our counties and individual disabled people as well across each of those counties and those regions was what I've submitted to you today. So um, it would be quite difficult to kind of say specific counties and specific areas. Um, if you needed that information, I could possibly get it, but I wouldn't want to necessarily share that because I don't know how succinct it would be and supportive it would be of what you're trying to achieve. I'm going to no, say no, there's that's probably that's only fine. four. There's probably only about four different ones. Well, this is what, exactly, Jules. That's what I was kind of getting at is, you know, it might be interesting to get to the, the root of some of those user user experience challenges but anyway so tim i appreciate you you, you gave me a little bit of extra time there so uh, i'll let you um uh yeah just crack on there thanks for the clarification so appreciate that that's great thank you and that, that seems to have sparked some um some really interesting discussion jess so, so we may well 
ask ask you to revisit that at a future meeting or or, or take that away into into other forums. So that's been really great. Thank you. Um, so sorry, Barry, we're, we've cutting you a bit short on time, but um, we've got um, Barry here as well from Parasports. So um, over to you, Barry. Yeah, thank you, Tim. That's that's great. And and yeah, hopefully this leads on nicely from from what Jess was saying there. Um, I'm just going to check that you can see see the slides I've got here. Yep, they're coming through fine. Thanks, Barry. Great, great. Okay, so yeah, some some really interesting conversations. And for those that aren't aware, I'm uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm I'm from Parasport. Uh, that is an inclusive activity finder um, on uh, as part of the British Paralympic Association Social Impact Offer. Um, and I'm going to talk around a bit of work we've been doing. Uh, in partnership with IMIN, so a couple of, of the colleagues on the call there from, from IMIN who've worked on this for us, and hopefully I do their, their, a lot of their work justice as well, but with a bit of a broader view to, to what we see the impact going forward and, and maybe some asks towards the end as well. So I'll try and whistle through. I've got slides, uh, hopefully they'll be useful to share afterwards, Tim, if that's okay, rather than for, for people to read through now, um, and I'll try and talk around them as best as possible. Um, so yeah, for, for context, um, we we set about doing a period of outreach and engagement um, earlier in the summer, um, which was around about, well, it's supposed to be three months initially, um, where, where we worked with our OD partners, I'm in, and we sought to carry out that, that proactive period of engagement to grow and improve um, the upcoming sessions function on our website, which is open, open sessions coming through that are deemed inclusive, accessible, or, or sort of suitable for disabled people, whatever that might be. Um, so yeah, we had a couple of objectives for the programme, um, but really the one at the bottom for us was the key one on, on sort of capturing the learnings and what does this sort of approach work and, and what the impact of it is. Um, and I think you'll see hopefully later in the slide deck that we, we have captured some really interesting learnings that will help to inform a next phase or, or, or sort of a collective approach to, to improving the number of inclusive sessions, the information that's included with them, which is what Jess was alluding to before and how we go about improving the offer for the disabled population. Um, but yeah, first of all, we started to, um, with, with that approach, and then we obviously had to put some measurables in there as well. So we, we looked to measure the number of activities that were coming through to Parasport platform itself, so inclusive activities, and then the impact overall to the system, um, and, a, and a couple of other ones there on geographical spread and then the breadth of types of activity that were going on as well. This was supposed to be initially a three month piece of work um, off the back of the Commonwealth Games in the summer, um, but the phase two approach there, we decided to extend that there because there seemed to be a bit more to do with that. And I think that's still the case now. Um, but but yeah, we, we decided to extend it by three months up till, up till just recently in December. So that, that, that part, we looked to automate it a little bit more in terms of generating leads and to reduce what we sort of will come on to a bit later in terms of a bit of an equality or accessibility gap in the number of sessions providers are, are putting on so open open data that are deemed inclusive so that's the sort of context and for us that I, I don't expect to read this but i thought it might be useful to share later it it, it it fits for us as a strategic fit because it speaks across all of our four strategic pillars um it speaks to empowering disabled people um by improving expanding information available but it also sought to empower the sector, hopefully, in that second phase to consider inclusion within their open data offer. Um, with regards to system wide engagement, obviously, we were doing proactive engagement and outreach, or I'm in mean, on our behalf. So that spoke to that, that bit. It helped to build our networks whilst growing our listings. And we've also done some shared, shared media and probably some more shared media to come off the back of it from some good case examples. In terms of building a community, um, it helped us to connect our audience to more opportunities and reduce some of those barriers. Um, hopefully some of those, not all of those that Jess was alluding to, but we're obviously trying to play our part in that. And then in terms of that fourth one there, embedding co-production, we've also seen this period of work engage our lived experience advisory board, which is a group of people with disabilities who, who are either community, sport and physical activity minded or former Paralympians who are also community minded. And, and all have different disabilities and lived experience. So the initial phase of that has been to sort of sense check some of the titles that are coming through to Parasport of, of sessions to, to sort of critique some of the descriptions and then go back to providers with that feedback from a lived experience perspective um, to improve what's going on 
in their listings. And, and that includes some of the language used. Um, and I think this could have implications to what we we're just talking about at the end with regards to the the impairment types listed on, on, the, on the sort of standards and also the language and imagery that, that providers are, are, are using for various sessions. So some good insight there from the lived experience perspective. So that's why we decided to do it. Um, as phase one, I'll, I'll skip through this. As you'll sort of see here in terms of numbers, I mean provided this report um, for us after the first phase. You'll see, sort of see some, some good progress here. Um, but you'll notice that the momentum grows as we go on. So um, Dominic and, and the team, Nish and Dom, were, were you know, really proactive in, in pushing for, a, for an extension on this period piece of work for, um, because they saw the opportunity that, that was potentially there. And that's the sort of second phase achievements you'll see growing numbers in inclusive sessions and lots more activities, uh, locations um, listed there as well. And, and this is overall. So overall, um we've we've added a significant number of inclusive sessions to the parasport platform itself but also through the through the work um and, and measuring the the sort of con converted leads if you like how many additional sessions that has contributed to to the system um am i doing for time not too well okay so 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 yeah you'll see on that bottom left one there um, 46 percent increase in the number of inclusive activities per week available as open data that's quite an impressive figure but when you get into the, the crux of it it's it's not not a massive impact due to um that bottom one here which i'll come on to it in, in a little bit um but some of those learnings as i said at the start it was it was key for us to understand what was working and what wasn't in this piece um so so we've sort of gathered that organizers want to be involved and associated with 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 the parasport or the british paralympic association so that sort of carries some weight behind it and has helped to reduce um some inaction in the past and, and overcome that barrier so that's been really positive um the number of inclusive sessions is limited in comparison to the population um so if you if you think of the disabled population in the uk which is widely thought to be around 20 percent of of the population um we, we've seen a bit of an equality gap at the bottom there where providers are looking on average to have between naught and three percent of their sessions targeting disabled people or being deemed inclusive what i will say is that open sessions are, are a bit of a, an outlier on in that front in a positive way so they're, they're much higher they're more closer to around 10 percent but when you do consider that that 20 percent figure of disabled people it, it, it looks like a bit of a an area that we can all look to reduce and, and overcome if that makes sense um so yeah our approach to to, to that would be obviously working in partnership with, organ with organizations such as the one on this call to reduce that gap and and improve the standards improve what we're what the advice is going out to organizations and providers be it large or small and, and about joining up um, on, on the resources in order to do that effectively. Um, so yeah, that's a bit of a, a whistle-stop tour of the, the last six months in terms of period of outreach and engagement, but I'm conscious that there might be some questions, so I don't want to go on for too long. And I'll just put my details up in case that's helpful as well. That's really good. Thank you, Barry, and sorry, sorry to um, cut, cut you a bit short with, uh, with the time at the end. Um, has anyone got any uh, comments or, or questions for Barry? <clears throat> Excuse me. And Dominic and um, Nick from IMIN, I don't know if there's anything you want to, to add from the work you, you've been doing with Barry. Yeah, sure. I can um, I can say a few words. <clears throat> I think the first thing is, um, you know, we were grateful to have that extended period to sort of continue the momentum that was built. And we saw there was a bit of a time lag between having those initial conversations with providers and then sort of helping them to understand what open data is about, how they can easily upload their sessions, and then seeing those results come in perhaps months later. So we also foresee that those numbers will should continue to grow as sort of more systems adopt the open data standards um, and as more providers sort of clock on to you know how easy it is to get their data open um, so the likes of upshot 
Sport 80, um, Substance Views, to name three organisations that are developing their open data feeds and sort of getting them ready. And hopefully they can also bring that consistent message to all of their different sort of um, providers. So so it's it's promising. And I think like Barry hinted, there's there's certainly potential for more, but you know, having those conversations um, and being able to sort of improve the data quality standards and accessibility criteria when providers are uploading that information, I think will be key. Um, but yeah, really, really sort of happy to work on this project and, and glad to see some progress on this. Thanks, Dominic. Um, I'm not seeing any um, any hands or, or questions, uh, but I'll just give people a few more seconds just in case um, anything suddenly springs to people's minds. Um, and if not, then I think um, we can maybe move on to any other business um, just for the last few minutes of the call. Um, Oli, I think you maybe had something you wanted to bring up, but I don't want to put you on the spot. So if um, if you've not got anything ready or, or you don't want to say it, then no problem. Yeah, I'm happy to to share. To, yeah, I just wanted to share the work we've done with Parkrun. So London Sport have been running a campaign on their Get Active cam, uh, platform to promote free and low cost activities during this, I guess, cost of living crisis, as it has been termed. Um, so we worked with Parkrun to upload all of the park runs in London. We've done that manually by open sessions. So we've we've done it uploading on their behalf um, because it's quite a lot of work to get all their event directors to do so. Um, so I'll share a link actually in the chat and you can see a filtered version of um, the platform and how it looks. It looks really nice, I think. Um, so yeah, we're really happy with how that's worked. Um, also noticed that there's other active partnerships uploading park runs um lincolnshire for example has uploaded park runs so i guess our the call here is that we've been speaking to park run hq however they said they don't have resources at the moment to work on their data feed um internally hence we've done this work um but if anyone has any contacts at, at, at hq um or has any influence um this might be a call even for sport england um if you have the yeah opportunity to to kind of share what we've done um, and again, influence part one to look at making our own feed compliant. That'd be really because I think there's a lot of um, want to cross England for these part ones to be uploaded, but currently it's been done manually, so it's, it's quite time consuming. Um, so yeah, just sharing what we've done and hopefully we can um, yeah together influence part one to get their feed up. In. Fantastic, thanks Ollie. I'm really sorry I didn't notice which order people's hands came up in. I think um Jules maybe you were first uh I'll be quick uh, just got uh, four things on my mind that I put in the chat uh still waiting for a national finder it must be somewhere useful um the open clubs we have open activities but obviously a club finder is something that we've all had for decades and actually having the, where things are is a, more useful because they may not have a find that may not have an activity this week but you still know where they are, so that's useful. Uh, social prescribing, we're looking at as a customer group and how we could help them do it. And also open referral. I found out about this this week. Uh, who knew? Great, thanks, Jules. Some quite meaty topics there, I think. So <laughs> perhaps not something we can uh, cover in in the last couple of minutes. But yeah, definitely definitely things that potentially we can we can put on the agenda for future future calls. Um, David, uh, I think you were next. Yep, thanks, Tim. Um, I am just popping the link in the chat for the steering committee, uh, the Open Active Steering Committee member um, job spec and application, which is open at the moment. It closed on the 20th of December. So if you would like to apply for it, great. If you have your want to share it through your networks, great. Um, what we're trying to do is share it through um, LinkedIn, through Corp, through the Open Active um, LinkedIn page, which if you haven't followed already, please do. But then also get people within the community and the network to share it from their personal recommendations as well, because that will just get a bit more traction and, and those kind of posts just lead to a bit more interest. So I pop that in the link. And if you can um, like share that and spread the words, that'd be amazing. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. And um, 
I'll add uh, some of the links and things from the chat. I'll pull them out and put them into the into the slide so um, people can access them after the call and anyone watching the recording. Um, you should find it in the description. Um, so then over to you, Nick. It looks like you will have the last word. <laughs> um, unintentionally. Uh, Ollie, that just is great with the parkrun thing. It was just a quick thing to say. Um, having been involved in lots of the conversations with the senior folks at parkrun, previously um if you're able to as part of that work either demonstrate the number of click-throughs for the free activities that you've got on that finder so they can see the value in having it open um or have an anecdotes from park runners uh that have kind of you know set even found it through that and then they've said you know they say actually it was really helpful to have it on the activity finder i feel like those two would be because the the heart of what Park run obviously care about is their is their park runners. So those two things might be quite helpful for them in terms of their priorities. I think last time I spoke to them, they just basically said we don't need more places that people find park runs. We've got enough people joining as it is. Um, so that so if we can if we can do something to disprove that, I'm not sure what that looks like, but something that says actually it is quite helpful for people to find these park runs in other places um, because although park run is very well known um not everyone still has has heard of it thanks nick um and i suppose that just leaves me quickly to say as we're, we're just ticking over time uh thank you very much everyone uh, for joining it's been great to see um a load of new faces on the call today i hope you all found it interesting and um useful and that we'll see you again um just an update that the there won't be an adoption engagement forum in two weeks time as that is the day before Christmas Eve and um, I think a lot of people will be off that week so the, the next uh, call will be uh, the first Friday in the new year um, so just everyone um, to let everyone know about that um, but yeah keep an eye on, on Slack and, and social media and, and you should see all the updates around around when the next one, next call will be but yeah thank you very much everyone I hope you'll have a good weekend and I hope to see you all again soon thank you